Where and when will the 2023 Ukrainian counteroffensive come? And what expectations should we have for it? Will it be a decisive battle that ends the war, or do we have to be far more cautious about its prospects of success? One retired American Brigadier General and the moves the Ukrainians have made in June in what appears to be the initial stage of the broader counteroffensive can give us clues about what we should expect for the coming months. Let's take a look. After Russian gains in Donbass in the early summer of 2022, Ukraine launched counteroffensives in Kharkiv and Kherson, which stunned the world. These two campaigns were far more successful than anyone had imagined they would be. Then the fighting stalled as the first muddy season and then the winter set in. Russia once again made slow, grinding gains in Donbass, finally capturing the city of Bakhmut at the end of May 2023, after nine months of fighting. During that time, international observers and military experts anticipated a Ukrainian counteroffensive, especially as the Ukrainians requested and were granted hundreds of advanced Western battle tanks like the American Abrams, British Challenger, and German Leopard II. However, the expected offensive did not materialize in the early spring, as many hoped it would. Ukraine was probably waiting for the delivery of those advanced tanks and other munitions in order to launch the counteroffensive from the strongest possible position. According to a report in the Wall Street Journal from May 17, Ukraine carried out drone attacks behind Russian lines during that month. The purpose of these attacks was twofold. First, these strikes would weaken Russian positions. Second, they are also surveillance operations, as the Ukrainians seek out points of vulnerability in the Russian lines, which would prove the most promising places to attack for the broader counteroffensive. The current front line in Ukraine as of about June 15, 2023, stretches over 900 miles, from the area around Kherson in the south, through Zaporizhia and Donbass, and up to the Russian border in the north. Trying to pinpoint the exact location of a counteroffensive along such an extended front is always a difficult challenge, but there are certain areas that would make sense from a strategic or political perspective for Ukraine to try and attack. What are these areas? What value would come from attacking them and what would the prospects for success be along each of these potential offensive axes? What are the respective strengths and weaknesses of each potential route? What are the risks involved in each strategy? In a May interview for the Wall Street Journal, retired American Brigadier General Mark Kimmett pointed out what he believed would be the four most likely scenarios for the 2023 Ukrainian counteroffensive. The first option would be a direct attack from Kherson across the Dnieper River to the Sea of Azov. The rewards involved in such a strategy would be obvious. If successful, a counteroffensive along this axis would cut the land bridge from Crimea to the other Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine and cut it almost in its entirety. As we've often mentioned on this channel, Crimea is of vital importance, not only for the Russian war effort, but to Russia's entire geopolitical strategy and to Putin's political image. It is home to Russia's Black Sea Fleet and one of its few warm water ports. Crimea is also a supply hub for the Russian forces in Ukraine. This is the reason why the southern offensive from Crimea was by far Russia's most successful campaign in the earliest days of the war. Cutting the supply line to and from Crimea would not only threaten Russian forces in Ukraine, but Russian control over the peninsula itself. The explosion on the Kerch Bridge last fall showed how vulnerable Crimea is. If the land bridge connecting it with the Russian border goes, Crimea would be limited to being supplied by sea or over that same bridge, a piece of infrastructure that has already proven vulnerable to attack. The route from Kherson to the Sea of Azov would be the shortest possible path to cutting the land bridge to Crimea. If the Ukrainians were to successfully carry out such an operation, Crimea would essentially be put under siege. Meanwhile, the other Russian forces in Ukraine would lose one of their most important supply lines. On the Russian home front, Vladimir Putin's image, among the high-ups in the Kremlin and with the Russian general public, would be seriously damaged if control over Crimea is substantially threatened by such battlefield developments. His image has already come under stress thanks to military failures, economic hardship, and the botched wave of mobilization he announced last fall. The last thing he needs would be to see Crimea threatened. The consequences of this possibility on the Russian home front would add even more momentum to the Ukrainian war effort in the field. There are daunting problems that would come with this option, however. Attacking directly from Kherson would involve crossing the broad Dnieper River straight into the teeth of the Russian fortifications on the other side. 
The Russian positions there would also be some of the best supplied, thanks to their proximity to Crimea. Unless the Ukrainians managed to achieve surprise, casualties would be very high. Even if the Ukrainians do manage to accomplish their initial objectives on the opposite side of the river, they would need to rapidly expand their bridgehead or get pushed back into the water by well-supplied Russian reinforcements. This option, therefore, is the highest risk, highest reward one. Most observers do not expect the Ukrainians to take such a risk, though that may work in their favor if they try to pull it off. Taking a risk that your enemy does not believe you will take is one of the oldest ways of creating surprise on the battlefield, a tradition which stretches all the way back to ancient Egypt. It was perhaps for this reason that a strange incident occurred recently. The destruction of the Nova Kokovka Dam in early June further complicated the prospect of the Kherson line of attack. Both sides blamed each other for the dam's destruction. Since the destruction of this dam could affect the water supply for an otherwise arid Crimea, some watchers find it unlikely that Russia would deliberately destroy it. However, the dam's destruction has now turned vast swathes of land on the opposite bank from Kherson into a flooded area that Ukrainian vehicles cannot penetrate. Russian forces also controlled the dam prior to its destruction, making them the likeliest culprits. It has therefore made the Kherson to the Sea of Azov route an all but impossible one for Ukraine to attempt at this time, allowing Russia to more fully concentrate its forces on other, more likely axes of advance for the Ukrainian armed forces. As expected, there is no significant movement along this sector as of about June 15, 2023. According to General Kimmet, the second possible option for the counteroffensive would also cut the land bridge to Crimea if it succeeds, but the route would be longer. It would lance down from Zaporizhia to the city of Berdyansk on the Sea of Azov. There are many advantages to this route. It does not involve a risky amphibious operation. The route has a robust network that would make transit and supply easier. The roads would be able to support the tanks and armored vehicles that would lead the attack on the ground. Many observers have considered the Zaporizhia strategy as the likeliest one. Previous Russian attacks in the area have not been successful, as the intensity of the invaders' resources has been directed toward Bakhmut and other targets in the Donbass region. The downside to this strategy is that there are major Russian fortifications in the area. Russia has long anticipated that the Zaporizhia strategy is in Ukraine's sweet spot of doable and rewarding. It has therefore taken pains to fortify the area and make a counteroffensive there costly. Even so, the Zaporizhia strategy is likely the most promising option for the counteroffensive, especially given that most Russian forces are still concentrated in Donbass. Recent activity suggests that the Ukrainians are probably attempting this route, but we will get into those details later. If either of these two strategies were to succeed, all Russian forces east of the Ukrainian line to the Sea of Azov would be cut from Crimea. Any supply disruptions from the peninsula would severely threaten their continued existence. Meanwhile, the Russian troops west of the line would be trapped in a giant pocket, and as the Ukrainians get closer to Crimea, more and more of its vital infrastructure, including the Kerch Bridge, would come into the range of HIMARS and other weapon systems. Understandably, Russia will try to prevent these scenarios from unfolding at all costs. Kimmet says that a third route for the Ukrainian counteroffensive could come further north and east by way of Donbass, the region which has seen the heaviest fighting in the war. The route would start in Donetsk and move to Mariupol on the Sea of Azov. Like the two other routes, it would cut the land bridge to Crimea, but only partially. The land bridge would no longer connect to the Russian border, but there would still be a large area connecting Crimea to a big percentage of the Russian forces in Ukraine. As such, the supply routes from and to Crimea would not be as well disrupted and the Russian forces within the cutoff area not nearly as imperiled as they would be via the Kherson or Zaporizhia routes. For these reasons, Kimmet is less enthusiastic about this option. He believes it would not significantly alter the military balance of power in Ukraine even if it succeeds, meaning that casualties would probably come at a high price for little gain. However, the Donetsk to Mariupol strategy would have one significant plus. It would be a major propaganda and morale win for the Ukrainians. Mariupol was the first big city that the Russians captured in the war. Most of us remember the headlines of the Mariupol pocket and the weeks of fighting that ended with a last stand in the city's steel plant. A scenario that ends with Ukraine retaking Mariupol would be a big blow to Russian morale and Putin's prestige. It would also be a signal to the West, which has begun to show some signs that its commitment to Ukraine is not open-ended. The recapture of Mariupol would demonstrate Ukraine's ability to make further gains, 
which is critical for its ability to maintain Western support at a high level. Such a symbolic target falling back into Ukrainian hands would be a symbolic image that Western leaders and the general public would find difficult to ignore. Kimit's fourth scenario would be an eastern offensive from Kharkiv through Luhansk. This axis is a short route that would, if completely successful, reach the Russian border. This route would avoid the Sea of Azov and thus leave the land bridge from the Russian border to Crimea fully intact. However, like the Donetsk and Mariupol offensive, it would have a significant propaganda value if it succeeds. It would retake the land that Ukrainians lost in 2014, when Russia threw its support behind the self-declared breakaway republics in Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts. The loss of these territories, which contained the seeds of the full-scale war, would be another blow to Russian morale and a signal to the Ukrainian people and the Western powers. It would be a successful offensive that demonstrates Ukraine's continued ability to make gains, even into long-held pro-Russian areas. The offensive would send the message that Ukraine's war effort is therefore worthy of continued Western support. A successful offensive to the Russian border in Luhansk would also open up more Russian territory to long-range precision strikes from HIMARS or to raids like that seen in Belgograd in May. Given how disruptive the Belgograd raid was while using relatively few assets, the advantages of keeping the Kremlin guessing about where new raids or strikes into additional stretches of Russian territory might come from should not be underestimated. On the downside, this strategy too would not significantly alter the military balance of power in Ukraine, since Crimea would remain free to supply most of the Russian forces along the front. Indeed, the front line itself would change relatively little from where it is now, with Russian forces controlling a vast swathe of Ukrainian territory and able to resupply and reinforce one another all along that war zone. Casualties would therefore be dearly bought for relatively little gained on the battlefield. Recent Ukrainian activities, however, suggest that this axis may be an item on their agenda. General Kimit warned to not place expectations for the counteroffensive too high. He does not believe that the Ukrainians will be in position to rout the Russians and drive them from all of the territories they have occupied in Ukraine's borders since 2014. He does not even expect the war to end in 2023. Rather, he is paying attention to how deep the Ukrainians can drive into Russian-occupied territory, which would preferably be as far as the water, the Sea of Azov. They've got to decisively defeat the Russians for this to be a successful counter-attack, and it's got to be successful enough that it will continue to inspire the West to provide material and equipment for the next counter-attack, and the next counter-attack after that, because this will certainly not end the war," he said. To sum it all up, General Kimit believes that the Ukrainians can launch a successful counter-offensive that would alter the military situation in the war and stagger the Russians, but he does not believe that the Russian war effort will collapse as a result. Instead, this offensive will be one of many in a war that lasts at least into 2024. After some shaping operations that involved HIMARS and other artillery and drone strike on important Russian assets in May, the first phase of the proper Ukrainian counteroffensive finally seemed to begin in the second week of June. On June 9th, Vladimir Putin declared in a video interview published to Telegram, We can definitely state that this Ukrainian counteroffensive has begun. Putin also claimed that attempted Ukrainian attacks on Russian positions had failed with heavy casualties. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also seemed to confirm that the counteroffensive had finally begun, saying on June 11th, counteroffensive and defensive actions are taking place. He refused to go into any further detail on the nature of the operations. Zelensky called Putin's claims of high Ukrainian casualties interesting. The scale of the operations has so far been limited. The Ukrainians are attacking along three axes. The first is around Bakhmut in Donetsk Oblast. The second is the Valkaya Novosilka axis, also in Donetsk. The third is around Russian-occupied Tokmak in Zaporizhia Oblast. The Ukrainians seem to be trying to draw the Russians into committing their reserves along these three axes. Once this is done, and Russian assets are stretched thin, they can try to effect a breakthrough in their desired sector. The Ukrainians have not yet made the type of progress they made in the counter-offensives of last year, but have advanced about 10 kilometers on all three fronts, targeting critical enemy assets like artillery and air defense batteries, communication hubs, and supply depots. Reports indicate that Russian helicopters have been unusually aggressive in striking against the attacking Ukrainians, slowing the attacks down and causing heavier casualties. The Ukrainians have also lost some of the Western tanks and armored fighting vehicles they have recently been supplied with, 
Russian drone attacks have also been far more effective than last year, as the Ukrainians do not seem to be doing a great job of moving their air defense equipment forward along with the front line. The Ukrainians also appear to be moving slowly because of a lack of their own air support thanks to a dearth of jet fighters which the Western powers are still reluctant to supply them with. Images of captured Russian self-propelled artillery systems which are swirling around some Ukrainian social media accounts have led some observers to believe that the Ukrainian advance has been more than the reported 10 kilometers. This speculation comes because the Russians would probably deploy these assets further back from the front lines. As always with an ongoing military operation, we will need to wait and see how true this assertion is. It is too early in the operation to say for sure which of the three axes is the main objective in Ukraine's strategy, although the Tokmak axis may be the most promising. An offensive along this route would be in line with General Kimit's second scenario, with Berdyansk and the Sea of Azov as the main objective. In comparison, the other two axes are relatively lacking in strategic promise. The Tokmak area has heavy Russian fortifications along the front line which Ukraine would need to break through, so diverting Russian reserves to Bakhmut and Velkaya Novosilka would be important for the viability of the counteroffensive. These two other axes therefore may be feints for the real offensive around Tokmak. The stakes for Ukraine are high. If they can indeed reach Berdyansk, break the Russians' control of the Sea of Azov, and cut the land bridge to Crimea as General Kimit hopes, they will not only significantly alter the military balance of power, but it is likely that they will also continue to secure strong Western support going into 2024. On the other hand, if the rest of the year goes by with only partial success or none at all, it is far likelier that political pressure in Western countries will ramp up on forcing a negotiated settlement to the war on much more unfavorable terms for Ukraine. With recession looming over the United Kingdom and other countries, it will become a lot harder for Western leaders to justify large expenditures on a cause that appears to be stagnant or fading. The Ukrainians do not have long to achieve their objectives for this year. By November or so, the fall rainy season will arrive and turn the open ground into perilous, muddy terrain, making the movement of supply vehicles, artillery and tanks or other heavy fighting vehicles difficult or impossible. The front will therefore stall just as it did last year. All wars are first and foremost political, and launched with political objectives. For Ukraine, securing Western support for the long term is its most important such objective, which means that for the counter-offensive, demonstrating the continued ability to win on a large scale is the first item on the agenda. Although cutting the Russians' land bridge to Crimea would make the most sense from a purely military standpoint, the political objective of securing long-term Western support is even more important. If the Ukrainian counteroffensive makes enough gains to ensure that support into the next year, Kyiv will likely consider it a success. The last thing the Ukrainian government wants is to be forced to the negotiating table at this point in the war, with Russia still occupying an extent of Ukrainian territory that matches the size of Iceland. To reclaim all of its pre-2014 territory, or as much of it as possible, the Ukrainians will need to repeatedly demonstrate that they can not only withstand Russian assaults, but win and continue to drive them back. If the Tokmak Axis is indeed the main attempted counter-offensive, the question will be, how close can Ukraine get to the Sea of Azov before the rains come? The answer to that question will be a big determining factor in the conduct of the war heading into 2024. But what do you think? Which of these counter-offensive scenarios would most likely ensure Ukraine's success in the Russo-Ukraine war? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.